Hello my friends. Welcome to my channel, Lindy's Magpie Reads. It's Friday, so I'm doing a Friday Reads. I'm going to tell you about six books that I finished recently. They're all good. Uh, the first one and the last one, five star reads, and the ones in between, nothing less than four stars. Uh, I like that story graph lets you break things down more finely. 4.25, when you read lots of great books, it's nice to be able to um, have more nuance in star ratings. I know star ratings are just uh, one measure, um, but it can be useful, especially when you read so much like I do. Before I start telling you about these books, I'll fill you in on what's been going on in my life. Uh, if you prefer to get right to the books, I do have uh, chapter titles, timestamps down below. So scroll down and you can navigate to whichever book you're interested in listening to me talk about. All right. So earlier this week, I made a quick trip to Edmonton and uh, signed some papers sold my house there. The uh, flight between Victoria and Edmonton is less than two hours, uh, but that's lots of time for reading. <laughs> anyway, I did have a chance to meet up with some friends there, including uh, my dear friend Carrie. We went to Bulgogi House, a Korean restaurant that has it's an institution in Edmonton. Love that place. And from there, we went to the Citadel Theater and we saw another friend performing in Rubaboo, which is a Metis storytelling and musical uh, extravaganza. <laughs> and it has been traveling around Canada. It started out in London, Ontario, and then it was in Vancouver. Now it's got to run in Edmonton. If you have a chance to see it, I do recommend it. And other cultural things that I have been doing. Lori and I went to the Out Festival. We saw one of the events. Uh, Ivan Coyote did a, a brand new storytelling performance called Playlist. It was fantastic. Uh, I saw one film at the Victoria Film Fest, a Mexican film called Totem. I also really enjoyed that. It's a story of a seven-year-old girl. Uh, well, it's her viewpoint. Her father is dying of cancer. And uh, it's filmed in a very naturalistic way, showing how illness affects extended family as well as immediate family and just the supports we have for each other, the, the financial stresses that illness can cause. Yeah, it was lovely. Uh, what else? I forgot to mention that I finished one glove. So the left one is done. I hope I can get the right hand looking the same. This is what it looks like on the inside. Oh yes, so on Fridays in Victoria at Russell Books, there's a poetry series called Planet Earth Poetry. And there's an open mic element and, and then they have invited, re invited readers as well. So uh, last Friday we went to hear Ali Blythe and Shonda Wilson and Lori had a chance to read at the open mic event beforehand from her most recent book, Walking Through Turquoise. She read the first poem in here uh, called Wanted, People Willing to Die on Mars. Now, I'm gonna see if I can get her to do a recording of that poem and put it in at the end of this video we shall see. I also picked up uh, Shonda Wilson's latest collection, The New, 
and two by Allie Blythe. Uh, the newest one, Steadfast, and the previous Hymn Switch. And I had already read Twoism, Allie Bly's, I think that was, might have been his first collection. Uh, it came out around the time that he was in Edmonton for the Poetry Festival and he was on stage with Laurie. She was uh, one of the other readers at that particular event. So it was nice for them to reconnect last Friday and we learned that Allie lives right here in Victoria. He's a trans man and this latest collection it's just fantastic. Uh, it's a Keats poem that has been uh, taken apart and for each line uh, Allie Blythe has written a separate poem. One of the questions that Blythe talked about in the preamble to reading is uh, it was about how can poetry be a place of refuge and yeah such a great thing to think about if you love poetry remember that's a place you can turn to when you need it okay so on to the books starting with as i said five stars territory of light by yuko tsushima and this was translated from Japanese by Geraldine Harcourt. It's a story of a single mother in Tokyo raising her two-year-old daughter. Uh, just one year in their life, right after her husband leaves her. And uh, this is set in the 70s and it first was published actually in 1978 uh, and at that time it was extremely rare for Japanese women to be raising children on their own and in fact throughout the novel we learn that people all around her keep encouraging her to go back to her husband. And like I said he's the one who left her. Uh, the challenges of motherhood, uh, and the sleeplessness, the, uh, the weight of responsibility uh, that's 100% full-time, it's addressed so clearly in here, as well as the joys and seeing the beauty in life and in her daughter. She turns three during the course of this novel. And one of the things that really made me identify with this mother is that she left it to the last minute to invite anybody to her daughter's birthday party, which was gonna be the next day. Just, <laughs> I could relate, <laughs> I could just relate. Uh, her, she's not necessarily always a good mother, but she's doing the best she can. The descriptions are so lyrical. It's a very uh, fragmentary story. And because it was originally published in separate stories, connected stories, over the course of a year in a literary magazine, so from June 1978, until um, the following year, 79. Sometimes there's repetition uh, where she's referring back to something. And if you read the chapters one after another, it's like, yeah, I already know that. But if you think about them have me having been published a month apart, you know, that, that makes more sense. Uh, it really reminded me of another novel that was published in separate chapters like that and I talked about it last week Forbidden Notebook by Alba de Suspedes uh, the Italian Cuban Italian writer and how a lot of the action is internal now this is typical of literary fiction uh, 
people will say, nothing happened. When in fact, there is a lot going on internally with this central character. Yuko Tsushima was born in 1947 in Tokyo and she died in 2016. And uh, the translator, Geraldine Harcourt, she got this published in 2018 for the first time in English. And then Harcourt died in 2019. And the reason that I picked it up is because Seb of the booktube channel Apocalypse Reading, he called this his number one book of 2023. So thank you Seb for recommending this book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Next I'm going to tell you about an audiobook from Australia. It's called Song of the Sun God by Shankari Chandran. And the audiobook is read by Shabana Aziz. This is a long family saga about a Tamil family from Sri Lanka. And I learned that Tamils from Sri Lanka don't feel, many of them don't feel like Sri Lanka is a homeland for them because they've been pushed out, those who weren't killed, through the long civil war um, that was ongoing there and the prejudice continues. The story begins in the 1930s and from that generation there are two subsequent generations that we follow. Uh, first in Sri Lanka and then in Australia. If you are interested in learning more about what was going on during the time of the Tamil Tigers, uh, this book will give you a very good idea, including the way that sexual violence is used, especially against women during wartime. There are some absolutely horrendous scenes that you won't soon forget. These are counterbalanced by um, scenes of family life and uh, humorous things like the grandfather has got really strong toes that he can spread and grab with and uh, he likes to <laughs> trick his grandchildren who get their fingers close <laughs> and get nabbed by his toes. I spent four months in Sri Lanka during a Canada World Youth program from October of 1978 to February of 1979. And Funnily, that's also the time period that this uh, Territory of Light was published. But anyway, in Song of the Sun God, uh, with, with each time that a date was mentioned, a year, I was comparing how old I was and um, when I was in Sri Lanka and uh, remembering that our group's uh, stay there in Sri Lanka was the last one that Canada World Youth placed there because for safety's sake uh, it was no longer uh, possible to um, set up exchanges with that country. And then in 2002 when I made a trip around the world working on organic farms, my round the world ticket needed to include a stop in Asia. And I had been thinking that I would go back to Sri Lanka, but right at the time that I was finalizing the dates and stops for my uh, airline ticket, all of the airplanes that were on the ground at the airport at Colombo were bombed. And I realized it's best to stay away. And I went to Singapore instead. 
These are the problems of tourists, you know? Uh, it's When you read a novel like this, the, the people that you're reading about are the, f the faces affected by that kind of war. And speaking of tourists, there's an example, um, this is in the 2000s, where one of the family members is uh, visiting Sri Lanka and she's at a uh, elephant sanctuary and meets a white woman there who is talking about how spiritual she finds the country. She says, where else but Sri Lanka would you find a, a sanctuary for orphaned elephants? And it just so happens that last week I talked about uh, a sanctuary for elephants in Vietnam. <laughs> so <laughs> Sri Lanka is not the only place. And the idea that um, Buddhists are so spiritual, uh, this in this novel, it's, they show that there are Buddhists who many Buddhists who do not hesitate to kill human beings. And uh, an example about the way experiences during wartime continue to affect us when we're in a new country, we're shown a couple who are filling out Australian census forms and they're having a lot of emotional difficulty with it. And it's explained that in Sri Lanka, census forms and electoral rolls uh, had all the detailed information of Tamil districts and individual addresses for Tamil families, and the government made it public and the, this information was used to specifically target Tamil families with horrific violence. Tens of thousands of civilians died. Here's a bit of conversation that I found interesting. So the grandmother, her name's Nala, once she moved to Australia, she loved watching Oprah. And she says uh, that Oprah says, we shouldn't be so afraid to disappoint others. She says we should just do the best we can and not be afraid of others' expectations. And her son-in-law Shiva says, I thought Lord Krishna said that to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. Wasn't that in the chapter on duty? And then Nala's husband, Rajan, says, no, Oprah plagiarized that. And the rest of her commercially successful philosophy from Karna's life, and that is from the Mahabharata. The Bhagavad Gita is in Sanskrit for the sacred song of God. So you can see where the title comes from. And it is a part of a larger sacred Hindu text. The Mahabharata is about a great war between two sides of the same family, which makes it uh, such a, a perfect element, a text that's referred to throughout Chandran's novel. Now, if you liked Pachinko by Min Jin Lee, I think this is the kind of book that you'll like. There's a particular style of Chandran's writing that didn't always work for me. And here's just one example uh, where a house has a, a living personality. The air around her was stagnant where once the powerful lungs of her grandparents' home had refreshed and replenished them all with the easy flex of its muscle. Uh, 
And another thing that she does throughout the novel is in the conversation, she has people say, what? When they've heard what somebody has said, but they can't believe it. And so the person repeats it and it's a minor quibble. The other book that I thought of as I was reading this is Kim Eklund's Speak Silence, which is about uh, the effect of sexual violence used against women during the Bosnian War. So if that's an aspect that interests you, I highly recommend Speak Silence. Okay, we're sticking with war. This one is a much more lighthearted portrayal. It's called Washington's Gay General, The Legends and Loves of Baron von Steuben. And it is by Josh Trujillo and Leon Hastings. Uh, Leon did the illustrations and Josh did the text. It's, as you can see, the illustrations here. Von Steuben was one of the most important military leaders during America's Revolutionary War. At the beginning of this book, there's a lot of discussion about uh, terminology, like, can you call somebody from the 1700s gay? Uh, Von Steuben was pretty extra <laughs> and he appeared to have long-term uh, romantic connections with several men at the same time <laughs> they these guys found so much fascinating information about him and had a fun way of portraying it as well I was surprised how much I enjoyed reading this book. And here's uh, just one example of the way that today's memes are portrayed. I've got another book out that I haven't read yet, A Million Quiet Revolutions. It's by Robin Gao. Uh, Gao is a trans queer poet and activist from Philadelphia. And this story is about uh, two trans men from contemporary small town USA. And they felt so alone until they discovered that there were trans men in the American Revolutionary War. And so I've been thinking about reading this. I haven't started it yet. If any of you have read this already, let me know what you think, because I've got so many books right now. It's hard for me to keep up, and I'm not sure if I'm going to read this one or not. Next up is another fun one, an audiobook uh, called Normal Rules Don't Apply. It's by Kate Atkinson, and it is a uh, series of lightly interconnected short stories and they're all um, multiverse uh, strange things a bit of a puzzle the puzzle aspect of it intrigued me so much that uh, when I got to the end I started again at the beginning and I listened to the whole thing a second time there's a, a, a talking racehorse. There's a fairy tale kind of aspect where a queen is making a bargain with a witch about um, having a daughter. There's uh, there's a talking dog named Holdfast, uh, and you do need to hold on tight because <laughs> this is quite a ride and so much fun. And next is another work of speculative fiction, The Moonday Letters by Emmy Itaranta. 
I picked this up because it is on the long list for the Dublin Literary Prize. This is a long, long list with 70 titles. I talked about it recently and I will include a link down below because if you are interested in world literature, this is a great place to find recommended books. There are libraries around the world have recommended titles for this award. There are 31 books that are in translation. I think they might have counted this one. Um, it's the author herself who wrote it in English, but she also wrote it in Finnish concurrently. So she didn't write it all in Finnish and then translate it. She wrote back and forth, both of them. So I, I think that's a bit different. And you're probably wondering, the Monday Letters, what's it about? <laughs> well, it's epistolary. Uh, and, and more than that, it's a collection of documents uh, that, are, that came out in the 24th century, and they are about events that happened in the 22nd century. So the two main characters are a lesbian woman named Lumi, who is a shamanic healer who was born on Earth in a place called Winterland, which sounds like present day Finland or Scandinavia. It's now a tourist destination. And the type of healing that she does sounds a bit like maybe drawn from Sami traditions, I'm not sure. But the earth is, uh, it, these are all the poor people left behind on a wrecked planet. And then we have Lumi's spouse, who's non-binary, a uh, botanist and research in working with biotechnology named Saul. So they are living on the moon and on Mars. They move around. And because of Saul's job, Lumi writes letters to them. And, and they're collected in a journal. So a lot of it is a journal with very uh, introspective, um, kind of a, a dreamy sort of feel. There's some lyrical descriptions of landscape. And the audiobook narrator, X.E. Sands, has this sort of cool restraint in her voice. It's kind of gravelly uh, and it's just really well matched, I think, to the, um, I don't know, there's something almost languid about it that just works really well with the style of this novel. And even though I'm describing it as being um, ruminative, there's a mystery at the heart of it. Um, what is happening with Saul? Why are they always not where they say they're going to be? There seems to be um, maybe uh, something to do with ecological activism and also the uh, tension between ecological activism and eco-terrorism. That reminded me a lot of The Deluge by Stephen Markley. So it seems that that's coming up all the time in novels that I'm reading these days. Maybe it's just because I'm reading stuff that's set in the near future, or in this case, the farther in the future. But this is what's grabbing my interest. And the last book that I've got for you today my favorite of the bunch is Landscapes by Christine Lai. This is on the Republic of Consciousness, uh, USA and Canada prize list. That's a uh, prize for independent presses. And I've been wanting to read this since last year when it first came out. 
again set in the near future. The central character is Penelope. She's in a dilapidated English mansion and she's a um, art uh, historian. She's archiving an, an old library there. This house is really falling to ruins. I can read you a bit, give you a feel for her language. We have now entered another phase of disrepair. The house has been falling apart for years. Rainstorms have inundated rooms. Heat has dried and cracked the paint and plaster. On some days, Mornington seems uncommonly fragile. Pipes burst, windows break, and parts of the facade peel away in the wind. People once spoke of Runenlust, of the picturesque and melancholy beauty of abandoned buildings. And now this reminded me of another book, a memoir by Kristen Radke called Imagine Wanting Only This. Earth is not in good shape. There are uh, protective uh, geodesic bubbles over uh, the tourist parts of London and Rome and Paris, but there's a lot of unrest. There is um, climate change migration going on. Uh, a lot of people who don't have homes and that theme of your home being destroyed, uh, finding a new place to live, that seems to have come up in so many of the books that I read this past week. Uh, Song of the Sun God and uh, the Moon Day Letters, uh, yeah, and this one. Though as I said, Penelope is an art historian and her favorite painter is J.M.W. Turner, who's painting in the 1700s. Uh, she writes a lot about not only Turner's art, but the old masters and the way that they eroticized rape in the images from history and uh, mythology that they portrayed in their paintings. And uh, Penelope also writes about how feminist art historians and um, artists, which she does mention by name in here, uh, counteracted that narrative starting in about the 60s. And uh, this relates to uh, trauma from Penelope's own life. So even though her journal entries that this is written in interspersed with her uh, ekphrasis type writing uh, and someone else who's traveling on their way to see this English mansion one last time before it's uh, totally destroyed and we get his viewpoint as well uh, it, uh, all of these pieces um, have a mood of uh, kind of an elegy uh, and it's uh, very meditative and uh, really, really gorgeous. I just loved it so much. My camera is warning me that my battery is going to die. So thank you so very much for watching. I might have a special treat for you at the end of this. Uh, we'll see. Uh, stick around. There'll be something. Please say hello to me in the comments down below. Let me know if you've read any of these, if you're interested in reading any of them, if you haven't read them yet, and uh, anything you want to tell me. I always love to hear from you. So thanks again for watching and bye for now. Hello, my name is Laurie McFadden and I'm going to read a poem from Walking Through Turquoise, which is my third collection of poetry published by Frontenac House. This piece is called Wanted, People Willing to Die on Mars. You just have to want to get there, you see, and devote eight years to the training. The catch is they have the technology to take you there, but they cannot bring you back. 
You'd think it would be the same technology in reverse, but apparently it's not. No return fare required. Strictly one-way roving. My friends and I at 16 were trying to not be ourselves. To be out of this world if we couldn't be dropped dead gorgeous or the first ones asked to the prom. I can't recall wanting to be so far out of this world that we could never come back. But there are some in every high school, right, who just want to disappear. One way to Mars, a willingness to die there. What other destinations pack that kind of punch? Suicide by astronomy, is that the right word? How many earthlings does it take to make the red planet redder? Or would it turn blue from the sadness of all that inevitable death? Wanted, people willing to die on Mars. Strict no return policy. What would you eat? Do they have pizza on that planet? Artichoke and pineapple hold the three-headed anchovies? How many trips would be postponed indefinitely if travel agents had to caution, oh, by the way, interesting scenery, but you won't be coming back from this place, like, not ever. What African safari can compete with this? The Sphinx, Uluru, Stonehenge, Niagara Falls? No contest. Like dysentery, death is a possible consequence of any travel. Trains crash, planes fall from the sky, lions charge, subways are bombed, mountains are steep, and sharks bite. You could get hit by a bus without leaving your hometown. So many of us drown in our own bathtubs, but ride a rocket to establish a colony in a place where drinkable water does not exist, knowing you will never return to Earth. What kind of person does that? At 16, trying to be out of this world, I hopscotched on railway tracks, peeled my bike across Thunder Bridge, sunbathed on our steep, stiff, slippery roof, and once to shed my shy, scared self. I ran to the shore at sunrise and dove naked into the chill of Georgian Bay, praying no one saw. Kawaja Beach, 5 a.m., shivering. Knowing there was beauty somewhere under the awkwardness and fear, knowing I could always come back to myself. From that place of skinny dipping at dawn, I might return red-faced, but I would return to a blanket, to comfort, to breakfast with snickering friends. That Mars want ad was real. Thousands of earthlings applied to go where no Uggs have gone before, where the atmosphere is thin, the orbit eccentric, the landscape dusty and dark, and death is a condition of the boarding pass. No illusions about ever coming back, no guarantee, in fact, that you would even make it off the launch pad. Do you do it for the epitaph? I'd settle for the moon.